Um, the first speaker this evening is Jonathan Steele, who many will remember as an excellent correspondent on The Guardian for many years, particularly in the time of the Soviet Union and Russia thereafter, and also has spoken at previous events of ours and brought an excellent analysis to the situation of militarism and the problems of wars in Europe and elsewhere. So can you give a very warm welcome, please, to Jonathan Steele. Well, this crisis in Ukraine has been dominated by two words beginning with H, hypocrisy and hysteria. <laughs> I'm not going to go into the hypocrisy because I think that will be the subject of what the other two speakers are going to be dealing with. The whole issue that people who invaded Iraq and Afghanistan got very excited over the alleged invasion of Crimea. Hardly a single person lost their lives compared to Iraq and Afghanistan. But I, want, I don't want to go into that. I want to go into his, the hysteria thing. And the way the whole thing has been exaggerated, this incredible narrative, as though Russia is calling all the shots in eastern Ukraine, as though the people of eastern Ukraine didn't exist. It's a, just a battle between the Kremlin and Kiev. And, uh, you know, the, 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 if anything is given to the people of eastern Ukraine, it's that they're puppets of Russia. And what I want to try and explain is why people in eastern Ukraine, and there are several million of them, not all Russian, many of them are Ukrainian, in fact the majority are Ukrainians, they identify themselves as Ukrainians on the census, are upset with what happened in Kiev at the end of February. As you know, that was a coalition of a number of, of a huge variety of people were in the street in the Maidan in central Kiev. There were a lot of younger people who were sort of the kind of globalized um, civil society activists that you read about all the time, who did the internet using, Facebook using, etc., who wanted or thought that they would get if they joined the EU a much more open kind of society. There were people who were worried about the corruption in the country. Uh, Ukraine is even more corrupt than Russia. Um, oligarchs on all sides of every single fence which is one reason why it's never discussed in the Parliament, because every single political party has somehow got links with its own oligarchs. So it's more oligarch-dominated even than Russia. There were people who were worried about the economic position, obviously, because the standard of living in Ukraine is incredibly low. The average salary is only 40% of what it is in Russia and Belarus. So sometimes you get the impression that the further west you go, the more prosperous you go, and somehow Russia is the basket case of the world. Uh, in fact, it's Ukraine that is much worse off economically for ordinary people uh, than Russia or Belarus. And, and then there were people who were on the left opposition in the Maidan who wanted a complete change of society, a much more socialist kind of society in which uh, the, the oligarchs would be removed from political power and uh, something would be done about the appalling standard of living that I've just mentioned. And uh, they wanted socialist answers or social democratic answers, some of them were saying. But they didn't want this neoliberal answer, which is what they're now being offered by the IMF, the loans that are coming forward, etc., etc. But they were also geographically very important because nearly all the people in the Maidan were from the west of Ukraine and so there was this huge contingent of people who were very hardline anti-Russian nationalists who come from the western part of Ukraine around Lviv which was never a part of uh, uh, Russia the Russian Tsarist Empire they came under the Austro-Hungarian Empire during the pre-war period between the first and second world war they were under Poland and uh, it was only really after 19 39 that they came under Soviet uh, rule and then only briefly at that stage because of course the Nazis occupied and uh, took over and uh, these neo-Nazi groups who were part of the anti-Soviet uh, struggles in the, uh, in the 30s and then carried on after 1945 guerrilla warfare it went on for about seven or eight years after the war helped to some extent by Western agencies um, they really are ferociously anti-Russian. Now they won, of course, because, as a result of what was 
essentially a, an unconstitutional coup. This was not entirely a, a non-violent protest, as we know. There were armed men there, not just armed with Molotov cocktails, which was shown constantly on TV, and rocks and paving stones and so on, but actually with firearms. And uh, there's a lot of evidence now that uh, much of the shooting um, that caused the final sort of climax at the end of February was done by people on the opposition side who wanted to discredit the Yanukovych government. But there's no proper investigation going on of that. Why not? Because the prosecutor general recently appointed by the new government is from this Svoboda party, which is one of these right-wing nationalist parties that have four ministers in the cabinet of 19 and also the prosecutor general. So the people in the Eastern, uh, and then what did they do? The first things that they did when they came into power, this, uh, this new government in Kiev, supported by the West, was to say that they would abolish the law that allowed Russian to be used as an official language in the areas of the country where Russian speakers were not only dominant, but uh, had a substantial sector of the population. Obviously, that worried people. They felt that culturally they were going to be excluded and discriminated against. Uh, then the defense minister said that he would cancel the, they, it would be a good idea to cancel the treaty which allowed the Russians to hold the Black Sea fleet in, in Sevastopol until 2042. So that, of course, did worry the Russians. Um, and the problem was that the only party that really represented in a substantial way the people of eastern Ukraine uh, were, was the party of the regions, which was Yanukovych's own party, which went into a total panic on the last day. And people just switched sides, just like uh, dominoes falling, and supported the installation of this new government. Um, sometimes under pressure, one of the MPs of the party of the regions was trying to leave Kiev, was trapped. Uh, at the airport, frog marched back into the parliament and forced to vote for the new uh, government. So it's a government which the West says is legitimate, the Russians say is illegitimate, and a lot of people in eastern Ukraine also say it's illegitimate. But the main thing is it's unrepresentative. It doesn't represent the people of eastern Ukraine. As I mentioned, there are 19 ministers in the government. Only two of them come from the east, not one of them from the south, big cities like Odessa uh, are not represented at all. And so it's a very lopsided, unrepresentative government. And naturally, people in eastern Ukraine are concerned about it. And so they have been talking about changing the constitution to give a federal system for <coughs> Ukraine on the model of Canada. Huge Canadian, uh, huge Ukrainian diaspora is in Canada. They know perfectly well what federalism means if it's properly administered you know, with language rights for minorities, with a genuine distribution of power, powerful provinces and so on, and a federal government. Uh, that's the model that many people now are saying they need in eastern Ukraine, because the, they fear under unitary, winner-take-all type of system, if it's dominated by a lopsided kind of government that they have now, will just discriminate against them. And that's really what they're pushing for. The other thing that they're pushing for is uh, non-alignment, Every single poll in Ukraine since independence has shown a majority against NATO membership. In 2010, when Yanukovych came in, uh, he made it his campaign promise that the security strategy of Ukraine would be non-alignment, uh, not joining Russia, not joining NATO, but non-alignment. That was ratified by the parliament that is still in existence today, same parliament, and yet it has never been accepted by the West. And uh, the fear of people in eastern Ukraine is that they can be dragged into the NATO under a tug of war when whoever becomes president on May the 25th takes over. And let's not, I must come to an end, but let's not forget that the only two serious candidates for president are one, somebody called Pyotr Poroshenko, who is an oligarch, a very wealthy man, extremely pro Western, and uh, uh, Timoshenko, Yulia Timoshenko, who, although she originally comes from Dnipropetrovsk in the east, is completely pro-Western in her thinking and her strategic orientation. So there's no presidential candidate that represents the interests of the east, and so that's also a big issue. They don't see this presidential election as a legitimate way of solving the problem at all. And they're now taking over buildings, 
in a sense, it's a kind of tit for tat for what happened in February in Kiev. They're saying if, you, if it was all right for people and demonstrators to take over buildings in Kiev, which they did, they took over the, the Kiev mayor, you know, city hall, town hall, uh, they took over some of the other ministerial buildings, they took over the huge Hotel Ukraina, which is one of the tallest buildings in the center of Kiev from which snipers were shooting. Um, they're now saying, well, if, if, if it's all right to take over buildings in the West, why isn't it all right to take over buildings in the East? And why is the Western media and Western politicians getting so excited? If that's the only way we can show our solidarity and our determination, then why shouldn't we do it? And uh, that's where we've got now. It is a kind of stalemate. There are supposed to be talks on Thursday uh, between uh, Russia, the US, EU, and uh, Ukraine. Um, but uh, it's quite dicey as to what's going to happen because on every side is now heightening the rhetoric. When I listened to the six o'clock news just less than an hour ago, unfortunately, I heard that uh, I heard that uh, Dmitry Medvedev, the Russian Prime Minister, unfortunately, is saying the country is on the brink of civil war. So is Sergei Lavrov, who's normally a more moderate and sensible person. Um, so the Russians are also moving to a sort of hysterical phase in terms of their propaganda. The country is nowhere near civil war. It's no need for it to be. There aren't enough arms to go around to, for a genuine civil war. And it really, it's not difficult to find a political solution as long as the Kiev government is willing to entertain the concept of federalization, proper constitutional discussions. And uh, <coughs> ideally, I think it would be good to have parliamentary elections, not just presidential, because that would at least give some chance for people from the East getting people elected on their side into Kiev. Thank you. Jonathan, thank you very, very much. I, I agree with John on the issue of Syria. I mean, I think there is a real danger that the collapse of reasonable discussions between the US and Russia, the insulting name calling that's going on, is going to make it very hard for them to come to any agreement on Syria. We have to accept, of course, that the Geneva talks in January didn't go anywhere, and there's not a great deal that US and Russia could do about it. But unfortunately, I do have to disagree with Carol. I mean, I think that what has happened in Syria is the greatest humanitarian tragedy of the last 10 years. Something like seven or 800 people are dying every week. Two million people have been driven out of the country. Five million people are homeless in their country. This is far, far worse a human tragedy in global terms than anything that's happened so far in Ukraine and that I think is likely to happen in Ukraine. The role of the EU, yes, the EU has been completely hypocritical. They signed an agreement with Yanukovych calling for a government of national unity on the day before he fled in the face of occupations, further occupations of the buildings. And instead of telling the new government that you have to have a government of national unity, telling the new coup makers that you have to have a government of national unity, otherwise you're going to split the country, you're going to inflame the people in eastern Ukraine, and they're going to rightly come out into the street, start occupying buildings in the same way. Instead of doing that, the, the EU, the three foreign ministers who've been there, just uh, forgot what they signed 24 hours before and recognized this new unrepresentative government. Uh, I mean, there is some splits, of course, within the EU. I think Angela Merkel is a little bit more sensible, a little bit more moderate, a little bit more pragmatic, unwilling to go too far in terms of sanctions against the Russians, and, try, and, and less insulting in her language. But uh, she doesn't seem to call the shots. The call, shots are called by the ex-Soviet members of the EU, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and of course the ex-Warsaw Pact people like Poland and the Czech Republic and whatnot who are really the hawks on this. And unfortunately, the kind of Western European members of the EU allow the, the, the Eastern European members of the EU to have primacy, saying, of course, you understand what the Russian bear is all about. You've lived under, lived under its yoke, so we'll take our guidance from you. It's ridiculous nonsense. Uh, the third point, I, I, I don't agree with the person there who sort of says that the two imperialisms are equal. In, in theoretical terms, perhaps they are, but in practical terms, if you look at what's happened in the last 10 years, the Russians have been mainly on the defensive, and it's been NATO, as we've been hearing, who's been on the attack. <laughs> and I hold no proof for Putin in terms of his domestic policies and, and, uh, and uh, all the rest of it, but he has reacted very slowly, and very passively.
massively to a lot of this provocation from NATO. Finally, I think his temper snapped and he's taking it out. But let's not forget that he works with the US on Afghanistan. He still allows US overflights in and out of Afghanistan all the time. Uh, uh, so that there is a massive collaboration still going on. I mean, it'd be nice if he had some sanctions on the US and said, we're not going to help you any longer in Afghanistan. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll go around again. In the corner at the back there, then here. Well, I absolutely agree with the last speaker. And that's what I was trying to do in my opening comments, to highlight the fact that there are people in the eastern Ukraine who have genuine feelings genuine resentments and concerns, and, and one can understand why. And it, it, Russia is not uh, creating this tension. The tension was created by the unconstitutional coup in Kiev and the behavior of this unrepresentative government <laughs> since it took over. That's the real tension. And, and Putin is trying to both express that resentment and, of course, exploit it in one way to prevent the West taking over the whole of Ukraine. So I can understand that. But uh, the, you're absolutely right, the crucial thing is to understand what's happening in terms of Ukrainian politics, the collapse of the Ukrainian economy, the neoliberal threat that's coming down the road, and not to see it too much in terms of the new Cold War, because I think that is, can easily be uh, avoided. Thank you. John? Thank you. Well, I think I want to deal with our friend from Lithuania's question, what is the solution? The obvious solution although it's a bit of a slogan, is to allow Ukrainians to decide their own future. But the trouble is at the moment, there's very little dialogue among Ukrainians because of this hysteria that I talked about, because of the hypocrisy I talked about, and the very important word that Chris brought up, demonization, that nobody else had mentioned until now this evening, the demonization of Russia. So I think the crucial thing is to find ways in which dialogue among Ukrainians can be fostered and promoted. And that means de-escalating the superpower rhetoric, the anti-Russian rhetoric of the US, and, and the talk that Putin has of civil war on the horizon, etc., etc. It, it doesn't help. The crucial thing is to create some kind of forum in which Ukrainians can talk to themselves, and that probably means some kind of constitutional commission where they can talk about their future in a, not in a rushed way, in a hasty way, but really thinking out all the alternatives, but to accept ideally that Eastern Ukrainians have as much right to decide the future of their country as Western Ukrainians, and, and, and they cannot go on being marginalized as they have been over the last two or three months. So that's the crucial thing. I think for Western people, the crucial thing is to resist this propaganda onslaught we're having, resist this demonization, end the sanctions on Russia, which don't help, end this punitive, insulting talk. I mean, when the West invaded Yugoslavia over Kosovo, the Russia didn't sort of say, we're going to have sanctions on the West, we're going to have sanctions on NATO. I mean, it's ridiculous the way they turn when it comes to military things, to bomb, 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 because there are no casualties, and then sanctions, 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 when they don't want a military actual solution. Dialogue is the crucial thing, compromise conferences, talking, and allowing the local people to be heard, and not just having this barrage of, of propaganda that we've had over the last month or so. John, John Lewis.